Today, I want to talk about the history of money. So, a lot of people ask me, and I can talk about the latest things in Bitcoin, but really what I want to talk about is ancient history. I want to provide a historical context for money and talk about why Bitcoin is important in this historical context. So, first, a little pop quiz for the audience. If you think of money as technology, as a technological system that human civilization has invented, how old is this technology? <laughs> Lots of different different answers here. It's always surprising to me that people will say, you know, it's uh, uh, 400 years old, 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old. Uh, in fact, we, we don't really know how old money is. And part of the reason we don't know why, how old money is, is because we have yet to discover a civilization old enough that didn't have money. Uh, so we know it's as old as civilization. And one thing that surprises people is that money is older than writing. And the way we know this is because when we look at archaeological discoveries of writing, we find hieroglyphics and we find uh, cuneiform and we look at all of these ancient forms of writing. Guess what they're writing about? Money. They're writing ledgers. All of the ancient writing we find, the first forms of writing, are ledgers. They are writing about money, because money is older than writing. Is money older than the wheel? I don't know, but we do know that wheels were used as money. <laughs> so they might be as old as wheels. Perhaps the first wheel was sold for money, or was used as a form of money itself. Uh, archaeological sites going back into the Stone Age show us the presence of money in the form of shells and feathers and beads used by Stone Age people. In fact, we can teach primates how to use money. If you have, and they've done several studies where they teach monkeys, uh, chimpanzees, how to use money. They teach them that a specific type of stone can be exchanged for bananas. And then they try to see what the monkeys will do with this new information, and they very quickly invent armed robbery. <laughs> because they figure out that if you beat up the other money and take, monkey and take its stones, you can exchange them for bananas. Surprisingly, the second thing they invent is prostitution. Um, they figure out that sexual favors can be exchanged for stones, which can be used for bananas. What does that tell you about the nature of money? I think the important insight into the nature of money is that money is a form of communication. At its very basic level, money isn't value. Money represents an abstraction of value. It's a way of communicating value. It's a language. And therefore, money is as old as language, because the ability to communicate value is as old as language. And money, in many ways, has these characteristics that make it a linguistic construct. So it's a form of communication. We use money to communicate value to each other, to express to each other how much we value a product, a service, a gesture. Uh, we use it as the basis of social interaction, because by communicating value to each other, we create social bonds. So money is also a very important social construct. So this is an ancient technology. And yet, ironically, it's one of the technologies that is least studied from a historical and technology perspective. We look at Bitcoin today, and it represents an invention, a new form of doing money. And think about for a moment how often the technology of money has been transformed by invention. How many different forms of money we've had. At a very basic level, the way to communicate value is to exchange things that we consider equal value. Here's a goat. I will take 20 bananas for my goat. That's not really money because it's a barter transaction, but it's the first form of communication about value. And then we start seeing abstract forms of money. So that's the first major technological evolution: is to start exchanging something that you can't eat. A feather, a bead, a string with knots on it, a colorful 
something that can be used for aesthetic purposes. And then money takes this abstract form. That's the first major transformational technology moment for money, when money stopped being about the tangible consumption of intrinsic value, but became something that referred to value as an abstraction. Very quickly, one of the most popular forms of these abstractions was to use precious metals to express value. Precious metals combine some of the most important characteristics of money, being uh, hard to find, scarce, easily transportable, uh, more, for example, than a giant rock or uh, a whole barrel of feathers or other forms of money. Um, easy to divide. You can cut a gold coin into pieces and uh, subdivide the pieces. And universally valued for aesthetic purposes. That's a major second transformation in technology. And it took thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, before we saw the introduction of precious metals, which is the beginning of the agrarian civilizations in the fertile uh, crescent area in the Middle East. We start seeing precious metals. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks developed these precious metals. Two major technological revolutions. And then nothing for a few thousand years. And then someone came up with this brilliant idea, which was, well, if I deposit my gold with someone trustworthy, then they can give me a piece of paper that says that I have my gold in this trustworthy vault. And I could then really start trading the paper instead of the gold. It's easier to carry. And as long as I still trust that my money is in the vault, then I've got a new form of money. Now, with every technological revolution in money, there comes skepticism. And I think this is the moment of the greatest amount of skepticism in human civilization. Uh, for a lot of people, this new invention of money as paper was mm, somewhat controversial. You think people are freaking out about Bitcoin? Imagine how much they freaked out when you told them that now, instead of trading in gold, they would trade in pieces of paper. Uh, for a lot of people, this was unthinkable. I mean, after all, clearly this thing does not have any value. It took about 400 years for paper as money to accept, to, to become accepted broadly. And trust me, it was a big aberration. Then, about 60 years ago, we saw a new form of money in the form of plastic cards. In fact, the first cards were paper, again. And then, um, in the United States, Diners Club was the first to create a credit card, which was a form of traveler's check. And then people took that, and they said, this isn't money. Why don't you give me some of the good old paper money that I know? <laughs> and that was another big transformation in money. And now we have Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is in my mind, a pretty radical transformation is as radical as the change from precious metals to paper money. Perhaps even more radical. So what is Bitcoin? This is the fundamental issue in describing Bitcoin, is that if you use references to our existing experience, that experience is based on thousands of years of understanding what money is in a very physical form. And now we try to explain a form of money that is completely abstract, that is a token that represents acceptance in a network, a network-centric form of money, but it doesn't even begin to describe what this thing is. And so one of the fundamental misunderstandings that I get when I try to describe Bitcoin is that people think it's simply a payment system, that Bitcoin is simply a form of digitization of money. It's like it's digital money. Great. Well, that's kind of pointless, because we already have digital money. All of you use digital money every day, long before Bitcoin came along. You have bank accounts. Those bank accounts have digital ledgers. You use those bank accounts to send payments electronically. That's digital money. Bitcoin isn't just digital money. Bitcoin is a fundamental transformation of the technology of money. and It's difficult to grasp, because it is so different from everything we know before. So I'll take a different stab at it. I want to talk about network architecture for a second. Because Bitcoin is not happening in a vacuum. 
It's happening at a moment in history where we are seeing a transformation of many fundamental social institutions. And that transformation is the great network-centric era. For centuries, social institutions were organized around hierarchical organizations, institutions, democracy, banking, education. All of our social interactions were organized around appeal to authority in these hierarchies, these bureaucracies of people. And something happened with the invention of the internet. We started seeing more and more of these social institutions changing from systems that were closed, not transparent, unaccountable, hierarchical, complex with their own rules into platforms. We start seeing the introduction of systems that have interfaces, APIs that we can access, where information can flow in and out of the organization. And so we go from institutions to platforms. And then we start seeing an even more important transformation when we go from platforms to protocols. And the interesting thing about the change between a platform and a protocol is when you have a protocol there is no central appeal. TCP IP doesn't work in reference to a service provider. TCP IP works without context everywhere in the world. You don't have to sign up for an account to use TCP IP. You just have to use the language. And once you go from a platform to a language, it opens up all of these possibilities. Bitcoin is the first network-centric, protocol-based form of money. And what that means is that it exists without reference to an institutional or platform context. I'll get back to that in a second. This is a really important point. So we say that Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer money. What does that mean, peer-to-peer -peer money? It refers to an architecture, architecture used in terms of computer science or networking or distributed systems, to describe the relationship between participants in a system. The architecture of Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer because every participant in the network speaks the Bitcoin protocol on an equal level. There are no special Bitcoin nodes. All nodes are the same. Peer-to-peer -peer means that when you do a transaction, every peer treats it the same. It has no context inside the peer's system other than that that it gets from the network. An interesting issue in distributed systems is this issue of context and state. Right? If you log on to Facebook and you have an account with Facebook, you are not using a protocol. All of the state is controlled by Facebook. You have a login session, and all of the data is held by them. We call that architecture client-server. Bitcoin is different because it is peer-to-peer, just like email or TCP IP. So, one of the interesting things that happens with money is that we are reluctant to discuss money. In fact, it is shocking that in almost all countries, money is not part of the education system. Five-year-olds have great questions about money, and most parents find it almost impossible to answer these questions. What is money, mummy? How does money work? Why do we not have more of it? Why can't everyone have more of it? And you don't say, Susie, go back to your room and study inflation like a good girl, and don't come back until you understand the answer to that question. We don't discuss money. Um, it's interesting that when you use the technology as a foundation of every aspect of social interaction almost, and yet it is a completely taboo subject. We all pretend that we don't particularly care about money, at least not intrinsically. We have higher goals and aspirations. We use it in everyday experience, but we don't really talk about it. It's a dirty topic. I think the architecture has something to do with it. You see, before Bitcoin, the previous iteration of money, the fourth great iteration of money, when money started being issued in exchange for precious metals stored in a vault, what that represented is a form of debt. And that's a really important concept to understand because it colors our discussion. 
How many of you have money in a bank? None of you have money in a bank. <laughs> Do you store physical money in a safe deposit box? Maybe then you could say you have money in the bank. Oh, a few people say that. <laughs> the rest of you have loaned your money to a bank. And for the privilege of loaning your money to the bank, you will be paid the amazing interest sum of 0.00001% per year. And your bank will take that money, turn around, and loan it to the people standing next to you for 24.99% APR. This is a client-server relationship, because that money only exists as a form of debt in a ledger that you do not control. A ledger that is stored by a server, and you are simply a client. In fact, you have no control over that at all. You don't even have basic interfaces to that money, unless that interface is mediated by the server. That is what a client-server architecture does. We have another term in distributed systems that describes a particular form of client-server architecture, where the secondary party only has a copy, a weak copy that isn't really meaningful. We call that a master-slave architecture. And if you think of the previous iteration of money as a master-slave architecture, you have to ask an uncomfortable question. Who is the slave? Because in a system of debt, one of the two parties is always the slave. You are the client. You are not the server. And the server doesn't really serve you. They serve themselves, because they are the master. And that is the architecture of money we live in. That is the architecture of money we use in our civilization. An architecture of money where you have no control. An architecture of money where every interaction is mediated by a third party. A third party that has absolute control over that money. And today, if you go to the ATM machine and you put into your card, the bank may decide to give you your money. And one day, as the people of Cyprus, Greece, Venezuela, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, and a list of hundreds of countries over the last several decades and even centuries have discovered. One day you go to the bank, and the bank does not want to give you the money, because they don't have to. And that's the essence of a master-slave relationship. Bitcoin is fundamentally different, because in Bitcoin, you don't owe anyone anything, and no one owes you anything. It is not a system based on debt. It is a system based on ownership of this abstract token. Absolute ownership. We have an expression in the United States, which is, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Have you heard that expression? In Bitcoin, possession is ten-tenths of the law. If you control the Bitcoin keys, it's your Bitcoin. If you don't control the Bitcoin keys, it's not your Bitcoin. You are back to a master-slave relationship with a bank. Bitcoin represents a fundamental transformation of money, an invention that changes the oldest technology we have in civilization, that changes it radically and disruptively by changing the fundamental architecture into one where every participant is equal, where a transaction has no state or context other than obeying the consensus rules of the network that no one controls, where your money is yours, and you control it absolutely through the application of digital signatures, and no one can censor it, no one can seize it, no one can freeze it, no one can tell you what to do or what not to do with your money. It is a system of money that is simultaneously absolutely transnational and borderless. And we've never had a system of money like that. It is a system of money that transmits at the speed of light, that anyone in the world can participate with a device as simple as a text messaging phone. And this represents a technological innovation that is terrifying to a lot of people, because it is such a fundamental transformation of money. And what they will tell you is that they're worried. They're very worried. They're worried that criminals will use Bitcoin. But the truth is that they're far more terrified than all of the rest of us will. Thank you. <laughs>